Already in his 60s, childless and in poor health, the choice of Nerva as emperor in the wake of Domitian's assassination in AD 96 has all the hallmarks of a compromise candidate, an experienced man who had given good service to the empire and was acceptable to both the pro- and anti-Domitian factions. He enhanced his reputation through a rule of moderation and by adopting Trajan as his successor. It was he who, with his voice rising in anger as he shouted out very many things against someone by the name Regulus, was seized by a sweat. When it abated, the excessive shivering of his body revealed the beginnings of a fever. Nor much later did he end his life, in his 63rd year of age. His body, as formerly that of Augustus, was conveyed with honour by the Senate and buried in the top of Augustus. With the death of Nerva, the succession of Trajan was without incident. This peaceful transition of power to successful emperor was Nerva's most enduring legacy. Dacia, Nebataea, Armenia, Mesopotamia, and parts of Persia all had been subdued by the armies of the mighty emperor Trajan. By 116, the Optimus Princeps had a statue of himself erected on the shore of the Persian Gulf. Then he came to the ocean itself, and when he had learned its nature and had seen a ship sailing to India, he said, I should certainly have crossed over to the Indy too, if I were still young. For he began to think about the Indy and was curious about their affairs, and he counted Alexander a lucky man. Yet he would declare that he himself had advanced further than Alexander. For this achievement he obtained, among other honors, the privilege of celebrating a triumph for as many nations as he had pleased. Of course, most of these conquests in the East proved ephemeral, showing signs of crumbling even before Trajan's death. But for the briefest of moments, a Roman emperor, the Optimus Princeps, was able to look out over the Persian Gulf and dream of conquests beyond. The Emperor Hadrian is known for many things. His travels around the Empire, his withdrawal from some of Trajan's conquests, his facing of a Jewish revolt, his ultimately tragic relationship with Antinus, but his most eponymous legacy took shape in northern Britain. Prior to AD 122, the island had faced a major rebellion. And so, Hadrian set out for Britain, and there he corrected many abuses and was the first to construct a wall, 80 miles in length, which was to separate the barbarians from the Romans. This stretch of connected forts and mileposts was what became known as Hadrian's Wall, with construction by legionaries and specialists taking six years. The exact reasoning behind the wall's construction is not certain. There was likely some want to defend against the perceived threat, as well as reduction of defence costs and tighter control of cross-border trade and movement. Despite ordering its construction, Hadrian never returned to see the finished wall that still bears his name. The reign of Antonius Pius was a relatively peaceful one, but there were still some operations beyond the imperial frontiers, such as the British campaign that saw the founding of the Antonine Wall in Scotland. However, the most adventurous Roman mission during Antoninus' reign looked to the Far East. The king of this state always wanted to enter into diplomatic relations with the Han, but Parthia wanted to trade with them in Han silk and put obstacles in their way so that they could never have direct relations with China. This continued until the reign of the Emperor Huan, when An Dun, the king of Da Qin, sent an envoy, who offered elephant tusk, rhinoceros horn and tortoise shell. It was only then that for the first time communication was established between the two states. This embassy demonstrates the awareness these two great empires had of one another, with the Chinese sources showing some geographical understanding, albeit muddled, of the Near East and the potential reach of the Roman Empire. When he set out for Syria, however, his name was smirched not only by the license of an unbridled life, but also by adulteries and by love affairs with young men. It is said, moreover, that he used to dice the whole night through, and that he so rivaled Caligula, Nero, and Vitellius in their vices as to wander about the night through taverns and brothels, revel with various rowdies, and engage in brawl. Often, when he returned, his face was beaten black and blue, he held gladiatorial bites rather frequently at his banquets, and after after continuing the meal far into the night, he would fall asleep on the banqueting couch so that he had to be carried to his bedroom. Modern writers tend to follow this depiction of the Emperor Lucius Verus, but is it really fair? This section of the Historia Augusta, dealing with Verus's supposed vices, may be almost entirely made up. Instead of being so debauched as to compare to Caligula, Nero and Vitellius, Lucius Verus oversaw a successful war against the Parthians before his untimely demise of food poisoning or plague. A renowned philosopher king, 
Marcus Aurelius was also a heavily active military leader, fighting several Germanic tribes. The most famous episode from these Marcomannic Wars saw the Twelfth Legion surrounded and close to surrender through thirst. What came next was attributed to divine intervention. For pagans, it was Mercury, when Christians said it was God. Justin Martyr places the emperor himself in peril and then writes to the Senate about the Christian aid he received. Having then examined my own position with respect to the vast mass of barbarians, I quickly betook myself to prayer to the gods. But being disregarded by them, I summoned those who among us go by the name of Christians, for having cast themselves on the ground, they prayed not only for me, but also for the whole army be delivered from the present thirst and famine. Water poured from heaven, upon us most refreshingly cool, but upon the enemies of Rome a withering heel. With the refreshed Romans winning victory, this incident became known as the Miracle of the Rain, 